Last time on The Empire's Edge. We've stopped the threat for the immediate future. Mm -hmm. Judging by the trajectory of the moon and the position of the stars, we should get the hell out of here. Are we expecting a fight? Yes, we're expecting a fight. A large, armored, tusked bugbear. Natural 20. I am rolling like a thing today! <laughs> One dart in the throat. Thud and is now inert. Uh, announce yourselves, who are you? I am Boris Kirsanov, Knight Errant of Arngol, on a mission to see the Baron. I charge you to find out what is the source of this power as we report here again. You're back to your room. You're all in that same room where you had your meal. It's mm -hmm. tantamount to a kitchen. And as you're sitting down, it's dusk. You're looking for a place to sleep. Really, there, there aren't places to sleep that are individual beds. It's pulling chairs together or curling up by the fire. It's that kind of living. Anything you guys want to do or say before it's just the three of you in this room? Before it's just the three of us in this room? Who else is in there with us? The attendant that escorted you there oh. and whoever's putting away whatever was left of the food. No, I'm going to wait for a minute until they go. Um, before the attendant goes, I would like to pray tomorrow morning. Uh, where's there a church of Uko? Church of Uko. There's, there hasn't been a church of Uko uh, in the town of Warland for as long as I've been here. And this person looks to be in their, their 40s, maybe even their 50s. There's a chapel in the keep itself. There's a chapel to Uko. Uh, I've never been inside it. It's been closed up for some time, but there's definitely a chapel here in the keep. All right. Thank you. Make and sure to... I'd get directions to it from here. So and and they do. The, the entrance to it will be pretty close to where the audience chamber was for Warland. Right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. When you said you didn't want to, you wanted to wait for that guy to leave. I'm like, do we not trust the attendant? He's a, he's a I don't spy. I do know. You never know. Do we trust them? He wants to go become a salt merchant in Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> and sell cabbages. My cabbages. <laughs> My cabbages. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, I think with that, yeah, um, wait for him to leave and then. Okay. So yeah, they put the last bit of food away. Everything seems all right. They give a nod to you. And they go out of the room. It's just the three of you. Oh my gosh. Can you believe that guy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What a what chatty a, What a poser. <laughs> uh, I don't know about you guys, but I definitely am interested in going around tomorrow to see what information we could find about what's happening around here. Yeah. The Baron did ask us to, to get on the road as soon as possible, but I was going to go early to the Druid Circle and see what I could find out from my fellow druids. Same, I was gonna look for some rangers around here to see what we can figure out maybe about that bugbear incident that we had. Mm, I, I'm probably gonna be heading out before dawn. What about you, Boris? I will as well, but to the chapel. Okay. All right, then you each find your own spot, the fire burns down, you fall asleep, you wake up rested with any lost hit points completely <laughs> restored. <laughs> yes, I went from yeah. six, well, or 13 to 13. Yeah, but we had been on the road for two days, so we were already Oh, okay. this is true, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <That's right>. The <laughs> bugbear didn't exactly get a chance to hit us <laughs> yeah. or speak. Yeah. <laughs> Why is that fertilizer walking? Life? <laughs> <laughs> Turns out he was a reformist bugbear. He was part of a caravan. He was trying to get help, and you just murdered him. Yeah, his That's entire family had changed. just been stranded in the woods, and he was really trying to find someone to help him. Because they're all in, in a bad place. Yeah, he fell well, down the we'll hill. Well, we'll never know, will we? So we're just going to assume he was an enemy of the state, and I took care of it. You're welcome. You'd like to think that, wouldn't you? <laughs> she was just following orders. <laughs> <laughs> From whom? So the next morning, you're picking... The state, apparently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that next morning, you're uh, going to where the guy put the food away, and there's stuff in jars. There's you know things that are just gotten cold, whatever. So there's some food there. You can nibble on that. Oh, but yeah, get, get, uh, get a good breakfast. Uh, you get an okay breakfast. Kind of a quick <laughs> breakfast. Uh, it's an MRE. Oh, God. That works, too. <laughs> All right. So, so I feel like taking a crap later. <laughs> I'm going to head out to um, to the Druidic Circle. And when I get there, I'm going to introduce myself as a Druid of the Adhar family. Okay. Um, it isn't like they advertise with a neon sign uh, where the Druid Circle is. But wouldn't you be able to kind of find it, I would think, pretty easily? No. Well, that's if there is a circle of druids in this Do you town. cast fine druid circle? Yeah, so <laughs> you're, you're, you're saying you're going to walk to it a little bit like there's, I, I saw it down at the corner, like it's a Dunkin' Donuts or oh. something. So uh, uh, more inquiry okay, well, would be. well, then I will speak with animals. What? I don't know why that triggered me to laugh. I was just like, oh, and Brightacus appears. <laughs> 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 no, so I mean, it's, boom, surely boom, there's class. rats and mice all over this place. So um, as you walk out of the building itself, the actual, the keep structure where you guys were housed last night, there are bluebirds, robins, all kinds of little animals right there. You don't see any rodents running around at the moment. 
So I'm going to I'm going to cast um, speak with animals and approach um, the most local looking animal I can find, whether it's a dog or a cat, maybe even a horse, somebody who's going to know the area. I mean, a bird isn't necessarily from here. Stop laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> the most local looking animal was the best part of that sentence. <laughs> well, like, like it might have a rope around its its neck. because so it's about somebody, to be hung? No, because somebody ties Hang. it up because it's local. Hang. You find Mr. Ed. I was thinking, you, you see a dog with an eye patch, and he's smoking a cigarette, and he's in front of the sheriff's office. <laughs> he, he, Hello, Zeke. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's the uh, blue jay that had the rope around its neck. It's, it's a, a medieval balloon. Um, okay, so um, I go outside. I, I see some birds, and I cast, speak with animals. And the, the nearest bird to you, or the nearest animal to you, was one of the bluebirds. And as you're casting that, it becomes very still. It's waiting on a fence post. And then when you're done with that, you've cast it, what do you ask of it? Um, I ask if, if it knows where the people who can speak to animals gather. Uh, and it says, uh, yes, I was sent here to find you. Um, will you take me back to them? Follow. I'm following the bird. So you walk through town, just outside of town. Again, Warland's a pretty small place, relatively speaking, five, six times the size of Gryon. And then when you get to the edge of the town, you can see there's houses on the outside of, you know, the outskirts of town. And you're led to a particular house. It looks nondescript in any other way. Okay. Um, I, um, are there people going in and out? Uh, there's a woman standing out front. She's okay. tending a garden. Okay. I say, good morning. Uh, good morning. You must have come from the keep. Yes, I did. I'm, I'm from Gryon. I'm a druid of the Adhar family. And as you're saying that, the bluebird lands on her fingertip, and she seems to be talking to it very low. You're not hearing the words. And then the bird flies off, and she says, they're, they're lovely things. They're wonderful for doing just that, bringing the people to you that should be brought and uh, brought closer to you. She said, I'm June, June Tannil. I'm of the same order as Ludmilla. Oh, my grandmother. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, grandmother passed away a year ago. I really miss her. Why are you here? In, in Gryon, there were a number of graves that were desecrated. Stone artifacts were stolen. Even grandmother was disturbed. Is there anyone in the town who would know about the properties of stones? As you're saying those things, two of the people come out of the house, a man and a woman, and they look very concerned as the concern grows on June's face as well. And especially when you say that your grandmother's grave was also desecrated in that way, it seems to confirm something in them. They're, they're exchanging looks with each other. And then June says, nature is attacked. There is something that's a, a perversion of nature. We felt it. When, when we were examining the graves, we found a piece of the Black Stair. We journeyed there. Does anybody here know any history of the Black Stair or know anything else about it? They say that it's from Old Bravis. No one knows specifically what it might have been. I've never been to it personally. I've heard of it. I rarely, though my love is nature, my skills are nature, to journey so far into the brim roar is a dangerous thing to do. But I've heard tell of it. And what people say about old Bravis is that they had abilities beyond those of what people know today, that somehow they could, I don't know how to say it, they could stretch nature. They could make nature different in some way. When, when we got to the stone stair, we had to fight a person that was there. He had a, a thing working for him. It was, it was a dead person, but it moved and it fought. It acted as a guard. Is that what you're talking about with, with the disturbance in nature? It must be. For it to take a form like that, some sort of a, a walking corpse, it must be. That nature was stretched beyond what it should have been. Has anybody in the circle known anything about this? Of all people, it was Lumilla that suspected something was happening. It was a terrible loss when she died. She's one of the few in this region that practice our order, that remember what happened at Vistar. We're not sure what happened there, but it was about nature. It was about nature being pulled in the wrong direction, as though someone had a an artifact or knowledge of Old Bravis. We don't know. It would just be speculation. 
We did find artifacts there that, that they had markings on them. The person who was working the camp seemed to be trying to do something with them. Is there anybody who reads Old Bravis or knows any Old Bravis in the circle? No. The, the circle is before you right now. Myself, Aina Moore, and Drew Lander. Um, so while we were at the camp, we found evidence that indicates we need to go to Horseshoe Falls. Has anybody been to Horseshoe Falls? Has anybody seen it? Or can anybody tell me anything about it? Oh, if there's a person who would know that, it would be Sparky Dawson. But I don't. I, I, again, I've never ventured further into the brim, brim road than what you can see from right here. So when we were coming here, we encountered um, a bugbear. And it had, it had been badly wounded, but in a way I've never seen. It wasn't by claws or bites. It almost looked like somebody was using a small knife and cut it multiple, multiple times. Have you ever seen anything like that? There was... Uh... An abbot, an abbot, an abbot of the Church of Uko, that asked us about that. Oh, that's been. They looked to each other. Well, it had to have been three years ago, maybe prior to that. He left when the Corman Civil War, the Corman Civil War, uh, when the Confederation Civil War started. He had said something about finding people that had been killed with small knives or small cuts, but beyond that, I don't know. And you said he left about three years ago when, when the war started? At the start of the war, that's right. Hmm. Yes, Abbott, she turns to the man she named as Drew, and he finishes it. Yeah, Ab Timothy, that was his name, Abbott Timothy. What about um, the bugbear being this close? I mean, he was almost on the road. Have you seen bugbears coming out of the hills that way? Once in my lifetime, and that wasn't a, an individual that was wounded. It was a raiding party. Soldiers from Warland went out and, and engaged it. Uh, they were all slain. So the, the other thing that we heard is that salt is becoming um, rarer and more expensive. Have you experienced that too? Yes, that, that's generally known, that there's, there's less salt. Is there any, has anybody been traveling from the, from the salt flats to know why that might be happening? You would have to ask around in town. I, I don't know personally. Uh, we have enough for our needs. It's a little more expensive. But then with our, our knowledge of weather, of plants, it's, it's easy for us to, to trade for the things that we need. So uh, I don't know why there's less. I guess there's, there's a problem in uh, Vlackveld. I, I don't know what's happening there. As we head out on this, advan uh, on this adventure, is there anything that, that you can teach me or tell me? Um, I know that we all practiced in the same circle with Ludmilla, my grandmother, but is there anything, anything that you know that could maybe help me? As she looks at you, she smiles, turns her head just a little bit, and says, very soon you will, you'll be able to communicate with us differently, but you need to further invest yourself in the nature that's around you. However, I can send word to you, uh, that same bluebird, if you see that bluebird and you need to say something to me, you need to communicate something to me, tell it to the bluebird. And depending upon how far away you are, how many days flight there, there is between us, that bluebird will get the message back to me. Thank you. Is there anything that I can do for you before I leave? Take care. Preserve nature. Thank you, June. I'm going to head back to um, where we were. So as you're walking through town, people are stirring, they're moving, going about their own lives. Uh, is there anyone in town you wanted to talk to, or would you rather we switch to a different character? Well, I'd, I would like to talk to Sparky Dawson, but I'm not sure I'm going to be the best person to talk to him. What I'm wondering about if Jacob would be the better person to talk to Sparky, if, if he's more kind of a tracker ranger type of person. So I'm going to head back to the room to see if I can catch Jacob to tell him about Sparky. Okay. Uh, and so while you're heading back to do that, Boris, you got up at the same time? Yeah, and went to the chapel in the keep. So you go to the keep as you're walking around the, the various doors, you, you get to this one and obviously it has not been open for a long time. And as you're standing there looking at this door, I'm assuming you tried, it's definitely locked. There's no one standing on the outside of it. There's no one on guard duty. There's no abbot going into it or out of it. It's just right. a set of locked doors. Well, I wouldn't want to break into a church. That seems a little wrong on <laughs> its own. Uh, I'm going to find a um, servant or... Someone like that, someone who would have a key to that and ask them about the locked chapel. So it doesn't take more than a few minutes. Somebody comes by and you ask just that. 
uh, a key to the chapel. Uh, wait, I, uh, I think you'd want to talk to, uh, to Kyle about that. Uh, just a moment. And that person disappears for a while. And a little bit later, someone who has a very steward look about him uh, approaches you and he says, yes, I understand that uh, you needed me for something. That's correct. I want to get into the chapel of Uko to pray. Uh, in, I, and he looks at you for a moment and you can see denial was on his lips. He's like, certainly. And he slicks a key from his ring and unlocks the door. Why has the chapel been locked and for how long? Uh, it's been locked since the abbots left for the Civil War. It's been closed since that time. Because of the war or because of something else? I would imagine because of the war. There are a few practitioners here. Uh, if anything, it was more of an embassy from Arngol College. I'm not sure if Sigmund himself had set this up or if that was the, the previous uh, head abbot. But once the war started, whether they left on their own volition or if they were recalled by Sigmund, I, I truly, truly don't know. But it's been locked ever since, and I was given the key. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, actually, he hands the key to you. Since you're here and you're a practitioner of this faith, it makes sense that it's more your space than it is my space. I'm honored, but I'll be leaving soon to head back to Grind. Oh, well, then find someone else to secure the key with, uh, and he walks away from you. Okay. I uh, pocket the key for now and um, enter the chapel. As you walk into it, it has the, the, the structural format. It has the, the floor plan of what is very typical for a church or for a chapel of Uko. That is, it is reminiscent of the nave chamber in one of those colossal Adley trees, those 4,000 foot tall trees that when you wind your way up one of the root ramps through a hole in the side of the tree and into this nave chamber, your arm would is tantamount to a wheel and at the center of the wheel is the lance of Uko, the seed pot of the tree itself. So as you walk in, you're in like the, the chancellor area, the sitting area, where all the, the benches are still lined up. There's side aisles, and you can see side areas to pray, different ceremonies. But then straight ahead of you is a circular area, and that is where you know the, the religious ceremonies take place columns in a circle inside that area, and then a very central column. And by your own experience, what you'd expect in one of these chapels is that it will be either tiled or painted to resemble as though there is the lance of Uka, that seed pod hanging from the ceiling, but it's just uh, like oh, either it's going to be, a, you're not in there yet, a mosaic image or a painted image mm -hmm. of that exactly there. Okay, yeah. I'd go through um, kind of looking for footprints in the dust, other disturbances like that. I'm assuming there's a fair amount of dust on the floor and surfaces. There is. Go ahead and roll your investigation. Five. You don't notice anything mm -hmm. about the floor in particular, the dust otherwise. Or otherwise. preoccupied. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, yeah, I'd uh, move to the appropriate point within um, the temple and begin to pray. Moving right through the, the aisle of benches, you're at the circular portion, and at the lead of that circular portion, the inside walls are, are decorated as though you're inside a tree. It looks like wood, but it is actually tile on the exterior wall surfacing of that circular portion of the, the chapel itself. There's a ring of columns, like I'd said, and then in the center, there's one column that does have tile work, mosaic work, that looks as though it is this lance-like shape of the seed pot of the tree, the lance of Uko in the middle of it, where it should be if you were actually in the nave chamber in one of the Adlai trees. Yeah, I'd kneel, pray for guidance, strength, protection on behalf of the people of Grian. So as you're in your prayer and as you conclude your prayer, it feels very comfortable, very relaxed, uh, as though the space itself is resonating with your prayer, as though it's good for prayer to be happening in this place again. Uh, and as you stand, concluding your prayer, uh, to your right-hand side, you notice that there is an open doorway that would go into what's probably a vestry or an office space for mm -hmm. the abbots that were there. Uh, but otherwise, though it's beautifully uh, decorated, ornately developed, it, it's very empty. Yeah, I'd kind of lament the emptiness of it, but I'd go in to take a look into the offices, that area of the vestry, um, and see if there's anything of note or of potential use. The first thing you notice is that there are still 
clerical robes, that is the, the abbot's robes themselves, that when they traveled, they must have had to leave quickly and traveled light and left a number of their personal items here. So there's, there's pipes, dried up tobacco that's still sitting on the counter where it would have been if they're just getting themselves ready. Uh, other items of religious significance, uh, nave symbols like the one you yourself received from Abbot Sigmund that are also sitting there, cloaks hanging up, but there's also a couple of books that are sitting out on the, the desk too. Uh, what are the subject of the books? As you skim through a couple of pages and go ahead and re, uh, roll a, make that an, an investigation as well. 14. You notice that the one seems to be fairly recent. Uh, it's actually dated and the most recent dates in the entry are from just three years ago. And it's sitting partially on top of a book that looks much older. Just, just the way it's bound, the, the quality of the pages itself look to be significantly older than the one that is partially on top of it. Okay. Uh, what, like, like a journal. Right. What are those last entries describing? Uh, drill an investigation for that as well. Uh, but with what you have so far, as you're reading it, you note that there is a particular symbol and it's notated that it's someone named Abbot Timothy, that he was writing in response to something or he's communicating with someone and then kept uh, an entry of whatever it was he was sending to someone else. You know that these uh, that the abbots themselves have the ability to communicate over long distances, wielding their spells, wielding the blessing, as they would call it. And this must be a record of what he communicated to someone else. Mm -hmm. And what did you roll just now? Eleven. Um, with eleven, the first thing you note with that is that this is from three years ago. Okay, I uh, try to investigate further, try and discern what was written, what was being communicated. Seventeen. Comparing it to what's above, there's there's references to an older set of similar injuries. It's what he's describing. And as he's looking at this, he wrote to someone, quote, incredible that the Zrek are again in Vistari after so many years. And they use the same knives. Well, that seems to be fairly pointed. Um <laughs> <laughs> so quiet <laughs> um <laughs> oh, wow uh now that my now that the mood is entirely fried i'd set the journal aside and look at the other book the older book what oh, is it go ahead it's again a diary entry it seems to be done organized almost the exact same way um but it's written in the hand and the notation of someone named uh, Stanislav, Abbot Stanislav. Mm. Uh, investigation again, you wanted? Go ahead. Uh, 18. With that 18, you start, you flip to a page, you're, you're leafing through it and you're skimming information and you find where it says that the Stanislav wrote three people who were murdered with small knife wounds at the base of the skull. And as far as you can tell in that description, that was the only wound on them. At the base of the skull, knife wounds, only there, like a single wound. And then as you looked further, you also found that there were a number of people, that two people died from small knife wounds, but they were all over their body, very much way that that bugbear was killed too. And written in his hand, it reads, I have only seen similar cuts to these in the surgeries in Quint, Hevlerette and other duchies in the Confederation. So small surgical knives associated with the Zrek, some killed with a single blow, others with many. And that single blow was not like somebody yeah. hit the jugular. No, it was the, at the base of the neck, like right. from the back of the head. That's bad. Um, Another investigation? Uh, I was about to do religion to try and gauge any particular significance with that. Okay, yeah, go Before ahead. reading on. Sure. 19. Wow. At that 19, you do recall somewhere in your studies, before you even came to Arngold, because you weren't there for much time at all, Right. something ancient and terrible, one of those things that when you're first into your training that you don't share around. It'd be like tantamount to like, like somebody passed this around in the middle school and we shouldn't know about this stuff, mm. that people could be separated from their very spiritual essence in some kind of a horrible religious practice with a single cut to the base of the skull. That's It'd be bad. like excommunication and 
death all at the same time, like spiritual excommunication yeah, in complete. the afterlife. I get the sense we're dealing with bad guys here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like uh, Abbot Stanislav was dealing with bad guys. Yeah. Uh, make another and investigation, then the investigation check. Yeah. Uh, I must be distracted by that realization. Three. Three. Um, that uh, you, the, you, you don't pick up on the fact that you know, <laughs> a tumbleweed rolls through. Yeah. <laughs> that the crickets chirp. That there's other information. You're yeah, just you're skimming too... through this a little rattled by that. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a comparative point with those knives and those knives. I can imagine you're looking at both books at the same time because he had them sitting out right, that way. Yeah, and and go ahead and make a make a roll again. Natural nineteen for a twenty one. Nice, very very nice. You can tell that the one was written fifty one years ago. Oh wow. Oh wow. So we're getting a repeat of whatever was going on when the college sent troops and crushed the starry and they're preoccupied well crap and uh, and with that same role you know with that the, the knowledge gained there as you're looking to what abbot timothy wrote one of his last communiques apparently before he departed was that he wrote quote remember captain slattery to rely upon the lance of uko and from within its protective nimbus resides the ability to smite any foe and that stands out to you because most of the writing is supportive, it's nurturing, uh, it could even be tactical at different points, but something so specific about actually doing damage to something, hurting something, smiting foes, that was not in any of Timothy's writing that you were skimming through up to this point. Mm -hmm. It seems different, and that's why it stood out. Okay, yeah. I'd take the journals. Um, anything else seem of particular use in here? Um, not particularly that if you wanted to somehow, or for some reason, describe your, or rather, um, um, disguise yourself as a, an abbot of Arngol, no, you could I'd put on one of those roles rather or yeah, robes, put on abbot roles. warrior. <laughs> yeah. I put on a sushi roll right now. <laughs> <laughs> I make myself into a priest burrito. I, I go to that central column in the nave and investigate that, you know, stylized image of the lance trying to find anything of particular use that way or if i can get a sense spiritually of something and of course as you cross that distance from where you stopped before and knelt in prayer uh it is it, it seems very hallowed you know it's a very very hushed thing right you've never done that before you've never walked to the middle of one of these you know that at some point you probably will venture to one of the adlai trees and the only living standing ones are in the confederation of duchies and walk inside it and go through that ceremony when you are knighted, when that's an official uh, ceremony. Right. But to walk across that now, even in this pseudo nave of an Adlai tree, it feels very important. Right, yeah. Uh, you go up to it. Go ahead and roll your investigation first. Okay. 17. You're very aware as you walk up to it, you're focused on the, the tiled mosaic image of, and of course, it's, it's only functioning from really one perspective right. of the... The, the seed pod that they refer to as the Lance of Uko. And it does look very much like a jousting lance in, in length and shape and all of that. Right. That right at the very tip of that lance, you can see that there is a recess, a real recessed area that is about the same size and shape of what you would say is a typical Adlai nave symbol that those abbots would wear around their neck, like they do at Arngol College all the time. Like I do, yeah. Like, like you do right now, yeah. <laughs> um, I'd take mine and set it in the recess. And as you do, the recess, the area of it grows, part of the column retracts, and then spins around internally. And as it spins internally, what is inside that area is a sword. Oh, nice. Uh, with scabbard and belt and whatnot? Yes. Okay. I'd uh, take it and belt it on. And as you're taking that out of that area right there, you can see there is also a, a rack for potions, mm -hmm. but they are all gone. Which is telling in its own way. Um, I'd close the, the, uh, that recess, um, take my symbol back, you know, put it back on, exit the chapel, lock it, and then, I don't know, leaving a key here. Part of me wants to take the key um, with me. It was given to you. Yeah, and nobody seems to be using the space. 
I will hold onto the key. Okay, good. So you, you put that in a, a secure spot in your person. Before you left the room though, or left the chapel itself, mm. and you're examining that sword itself, you can tell by the maker of it that this is what they refer to as an Arngolian weapon that's oh. made at Arngol College itself. Uh, and you know, rare. Uh, you also could tell that that the Baron of Warland was wearing an Arngolian weapon. Mm -hmm. And that must have been something very, very special that Sigmund or someone else gave to him at some point. Right. Because it's probably the only Arngolian weapon known right. within 100 miles. Mm -hmm. Definitely. All right, so you exit there, you exit the place? Yeah, and I'd look, f uh, I'd lock the door behind me. Um, I'd look for uh, Jacob and Zellen to share what I've learned, that we seem to be hunting a religious cult. Okay, good. So, Zellen, you got back to the keep, and you can see Jacob is exiting the, the main keep doors at this moment. Yawning because he slept in. <laughs> <laughs> what have you guys been doing? <laughs> Jacob. <laughs> Sorry, that was a visual gag. I... <laughs> yes. Um, in the Druid Circle, they told me that there's a person named Sparky Dawson who will know about Horseshoe Falls um, if you want to try to find him. Gotcha. Does the name immediately ring a bell to me? No, not at all. No? Okay. Yeah, um, absolutely. I'm, I'm very interested to figure out what happened with that uh, bugbear incident. Yeah, they, they didn't know anything about the bugbear. They said the only other time bugbears have come in, it, they came in to raid. They, they've never heard of anybody being, any bugbear coming down like that or being wounded like that. Yeah, no, this is definitely way further south than they normally are found. And just to put this into perspective too, the Baron of Warland said it happens sometimes. Which is very different than never. Than a raid happened once some years ago. So at that point, Zellin, I would imagine you go back inside to gather your things up. And Jacob, what do you do? Uh, did you tell me where Sparky was? No, I don't know where Sparky was. I just got the name from the Druid Circle. Gotcha. I will go into town and I will uh, ask around. We, we are in town, really. The, the, the oh, keep yeah. <laughs> itself, the entrance to it isn't outside of town. It's right there. The town's around it. Yeah, uh, I, I believe uh, the, a good place to go for information, I would probably look for near the edge of town. There's probably people who are awake, maybe a farmer who's nearby who he's definitely talked to people. I'll, I'll look for a local who I can ask and see okay. if that name yeah, rings you, a bell Yeah, you usually see there, there's people that are moving about and you see a guy that looks a little rougher, a little more haggard, looks a little knowledgeable. Yeah. And you walk up to that guy. A very local looking gentleman, if you will. Yes, yeah, versus a local looking <laughs> animal. Does he have a rope around his neck? That's really the only way to tell. Yeah, that'd be we a had, very different kind of He local. has an eye patch and he's smoking a, a cigarette. Resident. Oh, man. Yeah, uh, I go up to him and I say, excuse me, sir, how are you today? Uh, I'm well. Yes, I was um, hoping to get uh, a, a name. I'm trying to find a man by the name of Sparky. Last Dawson. Name. Dawson. Sparky Spark Dawson. Sparky, sure. Just head down to the creek. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, he walks on whatever he's doing, collecting a Turn wood around. For a what fire. was your name? <laughs> <laughs> Pete. <laughs> yeah. And I will continue on down to the creek. So you walk down in that direction. And again, there's there's buildings along along the street that gets down to that point. Or it's a dirt road. It's not really a street. Yeah. And as you get down to the edge of the creek, you can see that uh, there's what looks like maybe a guy does a lot of fishing, lives like Ma and Pa Kettle. There's just stuff all over the place. And you can see an even older and more haggard looking guy steps out from call to cabin, call to lean to, and looks up at you as you're coming toward him. And then he just turns away and walks down to the creek like he doesn't really care that you're approaching oh, him. Oh, gotcha. So, uh, yeah. Uh, resuming a non-threatening approach, just continuing down to him. And as soon as I have line of sight with him again, I, I, I call out and say, uh, excuse me, can I can I have a moment? Uh, he turns toward you. And I'm wondering, you're now assuming a non-threatening posture. What were you doing before? <laughs> Stomping my feet. Oh, I take out my bow. Like in a T-pose. <laughs> asserting my dominance. What's that kind of running when their arms are down and low behind you? Naruto no, running. <laughs> Straight out of just ready to headbutt him in the chest. <laughs> yeah. I'm just picturing Not... you, Naruto, running down a hill at some old guy. <laughs> and, oh, some, and somehow he got an that. AR-15. <laughs> and just puts you down. Yes, yeah, it just I, gets bean in the head i stopped doing Bang. that and then I, <laughs> I i i i walk up to him and i say uh, are you sparky dawson and as you're walking he's taking a, a unrolling a string from a board and he's spinning the thing around and he's throwing the string into the creek he's apparently fishing and and not really giving you a lot of attention as you're as you're asking questions so what do you need uh we 
Well, uh, we're, we're uh, let's say we. I'm recently uh, uh, arrived here in town with a, a few other people who are traveling in from uh, Gryon. On the road, we had a bit of a strange encounter. And where you we... needed to get back to Gryon. Not Son, just take that road and just go east. I do You'll appreciate that. I, I am, I'm something of a tracker myself, but much obliged. But we had an interesting encounter on the road here that we were hoping you might be able to shed some light on. A bugbear, of all things, this far south, charged at us while we were on the road. Other direction, this far north. They're from the south. Oh, they were from the north. No, they're from the south. They Oops, came north. Right. I've said that wrong twice now. <laughs> <laughs> the other way around, <laughs> if you're... Uh, Sorry, it's opposite day, and I was really into the spirit. Um, <laughs> a bugbear this far north. He wedges the board that he has that string around, that's his, called a fishing rod, mm -hmm. and straightens up, and he turns, looks at you, and he says, I didn't think you had anything to say to me that would be worth listening to, but you've got my attention. Yeah. How I, far back up the road? That was, uh, that was a day's travel, right? Yeah, so about about a day away was where this occurred. So a halfway to grind or a little bit more? About the midway point, maybe just past it. All right, so what killed it? I had had a, well, what killed it exactly was our rather accurate druid with a, a good shot to the druid? neck. <laughs> we have druids here. I, I never, knows them to ra never knew them to raise a finger against anything. Yeah, this isn't like other druids. But it was rather strange because it was already very injured when it came out of the uh, tree line and it had cuts all over the lower half of the body, very small, very um, numerous all around it. Slices like a very knife small wounds. blade. <laughs> a very small blade, like a knife. <laughs> well, you seem to have forgotten the word knife. We, so pronounce, it's not help we you. pronounce it differently down here in Orland. We say knife. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, then further he says, on, it's a conniffy. He says to you, Jacob, now you've said two things that I didn't expect to hear this morning. If he were still around, I'd say go talk to Abbot Timothy, because he was doing an investigation years ago about something just like this, but he's not here. All I can say is that it's happened before, and I don't know what the significance of it is, but if there was someone, something that could take a bugbear apart with I mean, what do you think? Five, 10, eight, 15, 30? How many cuts were on this thing to actually kill it? Uh, more than 30, maybe 40 plus cuts. So I can't imagine what could take on a bugbear doing such little amount of damage to it and not be dead itself within a moment or two. So there's, there's something pretty terrible. And out, out where bugbears are? You're talking really, really far south where the hills turn into mountains. And this was already so far away from where it was supposed to be, and it was in a bad way. Well, I tracked it back into the forest as far as I could, but I didn't see any signs of any other bears in the area, just that one very injured one. Well, you're talking about heading all the way down to the, the Reg Tet Hegyek range. That's the mountain range that's right along the Slagmark Desert. Jacob knew that. <laughs> yes, yes. He, <laughs> David yes, he was did. surprised. <laughs> also... Bugbears are goblinoids, not bears. Yeah, they're not bears at all. What did I say? Bears. bears. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> and you've, sure done, you've done that a lot, too. Eh, that's right. I say you bear, just I mean bugbear. You just When you say goblinoid, it definitely makes it a lot less impressive what Zellen did. <laughs> 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 it was a gigantic goblinoid. <laughs> <laughs> all right, yeah. So he's saying you're venturing farther south than what most people around here have ever gone. I've, I've never, I've gone into the mountains, but not that far south where, where the bugbears ha have their, their villages, where they, they, I don't even know how they live exactly. Well, you know, here at Warland, the Tulfava River branches in two. There's the, the quiet Tulfava that runs to the east and toward Hiller, and then there's the noisy Tulfava that goes almost due south. To get to bugbear country, you're heading the noisy Tulfava, heading almost due south into the mountains. That, that's a dangerous place to go. That's a terrible place to go. So if something chased that out from those regions, there's something that has a teeny little knife that is really, really dangerous up there. Well, you seem like you've recognized it. Do you have any sort of an insight as to what this thing is? What might be doing this? Only suspicions that uh, Father Timothy had said that there were some people up near, I'm not sure if he said it was near Vistari or if it was near Vlackveld, but someplace north where there are people that were occupying a region there. They were just were squatting, camping out. I don't know what exactly. I never paid much attention to them. But where, they said people like that had weapons like that. Where did, where did Timothy go? 
Uh, I think he took the road that bypasses Vistari and goes right to Bowling Guard. Probably from there, he'd meet the Corman Road and went to Arngold College. Where he is now, or if he's even alive, I couldn't tell you, but probably fighting up in the Civil War. And you said that was how many years ago? Uh, about three. All right. Uh, and when was the last time you heard of this with the bears, the bug bears, and these knife wounds? Or was it, it wasn't knife wounds, it wasn't bug bears before. When, it, when was the last time you heard about these these kind of wounds. wounds. Well, the last time would have been with Father Timothy, but I heard about it too when I was a kid. You know, it's coming back that there was, this had happened before. There were people that um, were found dead in, in a terrible state. Actually, people were actually, they were found dead. They were cut like on their head, on their neck, at their heart. I forget, there was, it was like a single cut, like they were just murdered by someone with a knife wound, but not deep if memory serves, not a deep wound like you get from a dagger plunged into somebody's heart. Uh, Something at the base of the neck? I don't know. I'm not sure about that. But if you would, uh, yeah, I'm not sure you could ask about that anymore. I'm one of the oldest old timers around here to recall something like that. But I do know that they had actually surprised somebody, somebody who they thought was the killer, uh, but then chased him off. Uh, and they were speculating that if they hadn't chased somebody off, they would have drugged the body away after they killed the person. So I'm not sure why they'd want a body after they killed a person either. Gotcha. During this um, sort of a strange adventure that we've been on these last few days, we heard about a waterfall, a horseshoe-shaped waterfall that has some significance to what's been going on here. Do you have any any idea what that might be referring to? Yeah, I know a place called the Horseshoe. I'm not sure it's the one you're talking about. Uh, the waterfall. That yeah. yeah, that's way up past Hiller. Uh, that's up, you know, up the quiet Tulfalva. I could, I could give you a general idea of how to get to that area. That'd be very helpful. There's three different creeks that flow down into Hiller. I'm not sure which one of those it was now. It's been decades since I've been to the horseshoe, but pretty good trout fishing way up there if memory serves. So if the trout fishing is good, we're in the right place. Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, how do you plan on getting to Hiller? That's off the beaten trail. That is a, a very good question. We've been on foot at this point. There might be some idea if we can find horses here that we might be able to rent. We don't know. We're going to have that conversation rather soon. We're... He points down to the creek. He said, in another day or so, I was going to take the boat up to, uh, up to Hiller. Maybe you could uh, run my boat up there and... Uh, let a friend of mine take the boat back down. It'd be doing me a pretty big favor if you could take, it's their regular shipment, stuff they can't get or can't make up in Hiller. Is that only going to be ready tomorrow or is there any way it could be ready today? He looks around at this kind of junk pile that he lives in, all this stuff around. And he says, well, if you give me a hand, we could have it ready in an hour or two. I might go grab two more people who can make even lighter work. All right. So we'll get it done as fast as we can. Ever rode a boat? Well, you look strong. You'll pick up on it. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> what, me, David, or me, Jacob? <laughs> no. Yeah, no, probably <laughs> Both not. of us need, no. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I will, I, I appreciate so much uh, all the help you've given me. I will be back with more help in, as soon as I can. And I right. want to take what I found in the chapel to the Baron, so he's aware of this before we head anywhere else. Okay, so. Can I talk to you, Boris, before you do that? Sure, what's up? So before you guys do, let me just make sure that we're, we, we've, we've, ended this for the moment with um uh, with jacob so when you say that he's like uh that sounds pretty good and uh dig me up something to drink from somewhere in town gotcha do i immediately take that as like he's he's looking for some alcohol or is he yes yeah, yeah. I figured. he's not looking for coffee yeah. <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> right? no and starbucks they have coffee then, on this planet <laughs> then he, right? he turns back to his uh makeshift fishing rod <laughs> ye and, old fantasy and, starbucks and catching his breakfast <laughs> cool all right so so Jacob is now looking for whiskey. Go ahead. Boris, when I met with the Druid Circle, I asked them about the bugbears. They said that the only time they ever remember bugbears coming anywhere near the keep was once years and years ago when they came in as a raiding party. But the Baron said, when we asked him about the bugbear, he just kind of shrugged and said, it happens periodically. I, I'm, I don't feel good about those are two very different versions about what could be a big threat. Right. I'm wondering if maybe if you found something, if we just keep it to ourselves for now, we don't, we, I just don't know what's going on and I don't want to overshare. 
I loathe the idea of the Baron being the enemy, but... Until we know he's not. <laughs> fair enough. Um, I will send a runner to Arngel College and Abbot Sigmund. Um, I I'd want him to know what's going on. Um, I'll do my best to code it so an interceptor wouldn't understand, but this could be very, very big and very bad. I agree. Let's not tell the Baron then. Okay. All right, so then after a couple of minutes, Jacob comes back into the room. I've gotten a lot of the really good information, and then I share it with you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm. We need to go down to the river. Our uh, our way of getting uh, north to our final intended destination is going to be by boat, loaned to us by uh, Sparky. Oh, great! But uh, we need to. We're taking a shipment for him, and we just need to help him load that up so that way it's ready to go by today. And I need to secure some whiskey. For Sparky. <laughs> for a sure. friend. For Sparky. <laughs> quotations aren't invented yet, and he makes quotation fingers. <laughs> for Sparky. Yeah. Great. Is that why they call him Sparky? <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, there you go. And, um, and I also share everything that I've learned from the Druid Circle. Right, with the yeah. two of you. Likewise. Right, blue so. Jays, you say. <laughs> <laughs> no, blue birds. Totally different things. Are blue Jays not blue? <laughs> Uh, blue blue jays all, aren't blue birds. All, all blue jays are blue, but not all blue birds are blue jays. <laughs> all right. Especially not blue birds, which is something else entirely. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a, um, a red jay and a blue gnome. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, um, I'll grab all of my equipment that I maybe left here. I don't know if I did, but we'll just make sure I got yeah. everything we've yeah, come here with. Up entirely. And you head down to Sparky. Hammer yes. and uh, well, sword and shield. I need get that uh, arm. That whiskey. Does um, we are we are we saying anything to the Baron before we leave or? Uh, and he, he already directed us to go. Yeah. Um, First thing in the morning? Okay. And I'd bring you, Jacob, in on the loop of what Zell and I were discussing about the Baron being a potential enemy. Yeah, no, I uh, don't think we should tell him that we think he's an enemy either. <laughs> Let's... <laughs> Are you a bad guy? <laughs> Let's, uh, I'll, 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 I'll find one of the taverns on the way, uh, on way um, down there and poke my head in. And while we're kind of going the circuitous route back to uh, Sparky, I almost said Smokey. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I'd find a runner to send Ar Arngol away um, with the message in as good a code as I can figure out. You know, stuff like an old friend from five years back is in the East. You know, that... Timo? <laughs> <laughs> I don't get that reference. Aside Ref from the guy I know called Timo. I oh, bet the <laughs> Abbot Timothy, whose journal you were reading, uh, is making oh, a yeah. reference to that. No, I, I meant... Zrex. Gotcha. Uh, you put that together. Go ahead and roll that. We're going to do what's tantamount to an opposed investigation check. Okay. Um, I you... know in 3.5, bluff was what you used to send a coded message. It's performance is what replaced that. Yeah, so it's a charisma roll. Either way, my charisma is better than my wisdom. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so let's do By that instead. one. <laughs> um, and that one could be enough. So you can send your send your message. That's a D12. I'm not going to roll that. That would suck. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Maxed out, it sucks. Uh, 16. Okay, so I'll just make a note of that message being sent. Okay. While we're walking through town, if I see a salt merchant, I'm going to stop and just ask them if they know anything about the supply line, if, if they know anything that's that's changed, um, where the salt is gathered. Make sure to ask him about Morse. I'll ask him about our friend <laughs> who, who's heading to Gryan to set up shop. Morris Young. He's very important to the plot. <laughs> uh, you're directed to a person named uh, Dolbin Bell. He's a local salt merchant. Is he also a wizard of great power? <laughs> Why? <laughs> it just Why? cracks him up. No, Dalbin from uh, the Chronicles of Prydain. Oh, oh, no, I wasn't even making a connection there. <laughs> wow. Literary illusion. So you're telling me you came up with the name Dalbin? Bell, just now, yeah. Oh. Um, okay, so I go in to talk to Dalbin and just ask him that, you know, we've met a number of people in our journeys and in our time here that have been talking about salt and how it's becoming um, harder to get and more expensive. Do you have any idea what's going on with the supply line? I have no idea. My contacts up in Black Velk are just, just drying up. I'm not sure if people are just leaving the area, what's going on, but I think it's the, the first sign of something truly, truly terrible. Uh, I don't want to be a naysayer, but, but I think that 
if something so necessary as salt is already becoming in short supply, that something horrible is happening up in the north. So when you say drying up, it's not that they're communicating to you they can't get any, it's that they're gone. I would think that they have fewer people that are either harvesting it or there is something else up there that is choking off the supply. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Good luck. Thank you. I walk into a tavern. Okay. It's early in the morning. Is it even anyone in there? The drunks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody yes. but Sparky okay, cool. they because them out. most taverns then were just the living room to somebody's house. Oh, and okay. They either made or produced, maybe imported, but locally they just make their own stuff. Maintaining my as charismatic as possible attitude, I want to be friendly with the barkeep and ask to purchase a bottle of whiskey. And I say, Hello, good morning. Can I buy a bottle of whiskey from you? One silver. Yeah, and I give him that one silver. And he gives you a very nondescript ceramic bottle. Cool. Can I get another one, actually? And I get two. <laughs> <laughs> two. Cool. Thank you. And, and so uh, you guys rendezvous down at uh, the edge of the creek? Yes. The creek is almost at the confluence with the quiet tall father, just on the, the very southern edge of Warland. Gotcha. I go so, over to Sparky and I hand him the first bottle. I said, this is because of all your help. And well, this is because you asked. And then the second one, this is because of all your help. Um, he says, thanks. And he hands one of the bottles back to you. And he said, I wanted you to get the whiskey bottle for Hugh. That's the guy you're taking it to up there. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, but I'll keep this one. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for your help. And uh, show us uh, show us what needs to be loaded, and we will help you. Okay, you spend the next hour loading up gear, making stuff's fastened, batten down. It's a rowboat. It's you know, fairly nondescript. It's 20 feet long, about four feet wide, and all the cargo is in the middle of it. There's a couple of benches, oar locks, and oars, and a tiller. And at the hour, you're done. Cool. All right. Yeah. Did we have any more questions for Sparky before we head out? I'm good. I don't think so. Yep. Gotcha. I think we're ready to Does anyone push know off. how to use a boat? Uh, Is that a thing? Yeah, I've yeah. got. Um, oh, I've got proficiency in land vehicles. I also have proficiency in land vehicles. All right. Yeah. No. So we don't. <clears throat> how do you know that? It's one of the things that you get for like when you're creating your character features and traits. Okay, so we uh, suddenly change our background so that, <laughs> one, so that one of us is a sailor. Yeah, during all of my time, like walking through the forest and desert, I really did pick up the nuances of rowing Robos. a boat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, a rowboat is, you get in it and you pull the oars. I mean, it's not hard to manage a rowboat. Okay, so, you're in charge. <laughs> I'll sit in the back by the tiller. <laughs> That's right, so... Uh, whoever is rowing is facing the wrong way, of course. Okay. Uh, and it's just wide enough that each of you guys could have one oar on a side. Okay. Uh, you could, if you have your arms set a little wider, you know, you put your arms out wider, you could row both oars, one person, but that'd be exhausting. So yeah. you work out how you're you're pulling at the exact same time. It doesn't take a lot of dexterity or, or planning. Uh, and Zellin's running the tiller. So you steer out. And again, he says just... You're against current, so it'll get more difficult as you go on, but I do it myself, oh, once a quarter, you know, sometimes two times a quarter. So if I can do it, the two of you can do it, and she'll steer, and you guys head off in that direction. You're passing through farmland, and people are walking down to the creek fairly regularly. Uh, there's a group of children, three girls, ranging in age from eight to 14, uh, that came down, they're dipping jugs into the the, the tall fava, you're only in the creek for a few minutes and then you're into the, the river itself heading upstream. Um, they're waving to you as you're going up by boat and one of them yells, um, isn't that Sparky's boat? Yep, we're taking him upstream for him. And they just wave, turn about and go in the other direction. Um, Another visual gag for you. <laughs> yeah. I wave back. Yeah, wave back. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, right. And then after about four, you're still in farmland this entire way. Uh, sometimes it's very overgrown right along the sides. You, if you just beach the boat, you couldn't get up the embankment. It's so overgrown. Mm -hmm. And in some places, it's clear and grassy right down to the water itself. So you tell me as you're going north if you ever want to put in and um, do any exploration on the, the sides. How long was the, uh, the journey? How long did he tell us it was supposed to take? Uh, he didn't. No. You didn't ask. We did not. Yeah. We just know who we're looking for when we get up there. Nine years. <laughs> Seven hours later. So right. as you oh, are, crap, we're Gendry <laughs> rowing for years. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I, but that was a SpongeBob reference, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So he made a rainbow with his fingers. Use your imagination. And then Jacques Cousteau. 
three hours later. Yep. Yeah. Half a day goes by. You're not sure where along the quiet tall fava you are, but again, you're passing through farmland and every once in a while, there's someone not too far from the embankment doing whatever work they're doing. And everyone you know, takes a long stare at the three of you and put a hand up just to wave to see if they get a wave back. But no one yet has inquired anything more specific. Be, you know, from their point of view, you're fairly heavily armed looking people all traveling in a boat and, and they're not <laughs> sure Sparky's what to boat. make. Yeah, do, do we want to? Sparky's boat, yeah. yeah. Do we want to put in next to one of these people and we can ask I them? I don't think we have to put in, but I wonder if we could just call out if they're close enough to ask them how far how far to Hiller. You're the non-threatening one. <laughs> Quote, she's, she's killed, killed, she's the she's one that killed, killed the everything. <laughs> if... if if you two would both be quiet, you would hear my quote unquote. You know, um, hey, fertilizer walking around. <laughs> have a, have a quick hey, oh my uh, God. Meat bag. <laughs> Blood makes the grass grow. Target. <laughs> oh my God. What a um, druid. If, if anybody is close enough, I'll call out the to them and ask them how far to Hiller. Uh, yeah, somebody responds to you and they say, uh, uh, Rowan, at that pace, you should be there sometime around sunset. Um, I say we just keep going. Yeah, might as well. Yeah. Thank you. And you row on. So about... We arrive and it's a ruin, like four, they're directly four. into an encounter. <laughs> <laughs> when it is, call it dinner time, you know, five, six o'clock in the evening, uh, you get to a spot where the embankments are much, much lower. Uh, the fields seem uh, larger, but more of them are in fallow. You're getting through like light woodland. It's it's not the same growing area. You're, you're heading steadily up river. You go across some areas of... Um, uh, not rapids, but light rocks. You know, it's, it's a little more to, to drag it over it. And you can't imagine how Sparky does this all by himself with both oars, but you, know, you can still... He's secretly a hill giant. <laughs> <laughs> right? You can still take the, the boat up that you see a person way, way off on the east side of the river, maybe about a half a mile away. And it just seems odd the way he's standing there, very still watching in your direction. He's just a dot, you know, that far away. But you can make out the silhouette being that of, you know, a, a person, a human being, but just watching you from where you are. Male? Uh, as far as you can tell. Uh, you roll an investigation to see if you can, like, like use your zoom in vision with your eyes. Never mind. Okay. Oh, I, <laughs> I was about to make an intimidation check. No, investigation is a nine. Yeah, from half a mile away, he's like, you see his knees start to shake. You're, you're completely intimidated. Beats the right shit there. out of my three. Uh, what do you say you rolled? Nine. Yeah, it, it, it could be, but honestly, from this distance, it, it could be a woman. You really don't know. I'll keep an eye on him as we're uh, continuing to row and just seeing if he falters in any way or begins walking in a direction. And I'm going to steer towards the opposite bank if I can, if the water is deep enough that I can give us some more distance between this person and that person. Okay, yeah. So you're maneuvering that way isn't isn't difficult and you've gotten the, the hang of this pretty quickly. Anyone else on the, uh, on the banks nearby or is it just the one? Well, that's what's interesting about this. You can tell that these areas used to be farmed regularly and it happens all the time. You know, somebody dies no one takes over that land and trees start to grow up. So this is an area where it looks like there's just fewer people, there's less farming going on, you're getting further up into the hills. So that all makes sense, but that's what seems kind of weird. It's been a while since you've seen a house anywhere along the, along the river itself or any farm, any fences, any signs. It just looks like there's a guy standing there all by himself. And then as you pull up about dead even with him, and again, he's still a great distance away, he turns about, and just starts running very fast back up into the trees and then disappears. Okay. Before he was good. able to take off that we were a little bit closer to him, did we get any sort of a better look at him, descriptors? Or how he's missing half his head or something to that right, effect. Right, yeah, did he look alive? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so go ahead and roll those investigations. Uh, and since you're looking together, yeah, go ahead okay. and do that with advantage. And that means, again, you roll it twice and take the better one. Ooh, modified 20. Unnatural also modi 20. Also modified 20. <laughs> and what'd you roll, Zelda? Unnatural 20. A natural? Un. 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 So, That's why we say modify. Modify yeah. 20, modify 20. Hers was a natural. Yeah. So, <laughs> my hearing, uh, the, that natural and unnatural are so close to the same. Crit the, Thulu. The Modified 20. There is the way that he ran, just the nature of the moving. No, you didn't see like half his head missing. Or like, <laughs> like, you know, his biceps sloughed off his arm or something. Yay, first of all, mm -hmm. but also boo. <laughs> but the nature of how he ran, the actual, uh, the physical movement itself looked just like it did when that thing came running after you or running up to you when you were battling on the black stair. Oh God. I it, hate is being it too right. Far, is it too far to get an arrow? Is it's it already, gone? It's already disappeared. Is it gone? 
Is it yeah, too far yeah, to it's, entangle? It's disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So you see uh, uh, Zellin tests the wind. He sticks his finger in his mouth and holds his finger up in the air to test where the wind is, uh, knocks an arrow and just points it at this oblique angle up in the air and goes thunk <laughs> and waits a few minutes. And then it disappears into the trees and you hear, oh, <laughs> nice. That'd be great. That would be Somebody that'd shot be awesome. me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right in my bad leg. <laughs> <laughs> Hugh had a bad leg. I know. So yeah, um, I guess we've pulled up to a dock. Jacob Cripple Shooter Treadstone. <laughs> 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 Sounds like a t-shirt. Oh my God. <laughs> have, we, have we found the dock? Is that, do we also see that? No, that was still some time away. So, getting there. so the you're dock. still rowing for a number of hours. And oh. you're beginning to think that when this guy said that you should get there at the rate you're rowing by the end of the day, he was either a liar or he's never done it himself. Gotcha. So it's dusk well, and I there's no, there's no town. How much further did we make it past the, uh, definitely still not undead guy? Oh, before it gets to be dusk? Yeah. Miles, five, six miles, maybe. We're going to have right. to, we're going to have to dock yeah. and camp, don't you think? Yeah. I think we would have closer to sunset. Because we don't know where we're going, and I don't know about you guys, but I can't see in the dark. Yeah, well, dusk, it's, so we have some time. So we'll f not we'll, not if we're setting up camp. We need more time than that. Yeah, I agree. So we'll look for a place to to beach in, and um, a lot of areas, a lot of places around this area where the embankments are a lot lower, it's less overgrown. I'd it's like just... to find a place that's on the opposite side of the bank from where the weird thing ran off into the woods. Okay, so you're looking on the west side of we're the, uh, the, west of the side. tall fog. Very smart, yeah. The okay. probably zombie. Yes, you do find uh, an area you can beach there with the three of you together. You can drag the boat up just a little bit. It isn't like there's going to be a tide or something that's going to mm -hmm. you know float the boat back down again. So it seems pretty secure. And on that embankment, you set up a camp. Uh, dark camp, lit camp. I say dark. I say yeah. dark. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then definitely and, having watches. Right. Yep. Okay. Who's on first? Who's second? Who's third? I'll take first because I haven't been rowing. Okay. Uh, do you want second? I'll take third. Agreed. Okay. Okay. Rolling for random encounters and otherwise. Zellin, once they're, everyone's had a bite to eat from you know, the food they brought along with them, you hear something, sounds like it could be just a deer walking. But go ahead and do an investigation to listen specifically. 18. It sounds an off like somebody walking toward your camp from the other side of the tall fava. Hmm. Um, I'm going to wake up Jacob because he has the bow okay. and say, I hear somebody. I, th I think they're walking towards our camp. Gotcha. I will pause and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, take, a, take a quick listen to uh, eight. Yeah, just you can just hear your own heart beating. You can't are, hear anything from that side at all. Are you sure? I'm getting absolutely nothing. Hey, I heard something. I heard I heard something from the from the other side of the creek. Start shaking them, Boris. How force. wide is the creek? Uh, well, it's still part of the oh. river, but it would only be about a hundred feet across right here. It's pretty narrow. Potential uh, hostiles nearby across the river. Zellin says she hears footsteps. Uh, with them assisting me, I am going to go ahead. Roll, and roll to advantage. She's giving you a directional, kind of in that direction, and she points. One was a 16, the other was a 1. I'm going to go with that 16 <laughs> for an 18. You do hear it, but it sounds more like it's now walking away. Huh. Backing off now. I'm going to um, hurl flame. I'm going to create a small flame. <laughs> what? Oh, this is a forest! <laughs> <laughs> I'm going well, to I'm gonna throw it on the river. I'm going to... I'm gonna I'm gonna produce a small flame okay. and throw it onto you the do. river to see if I could see anything. And the river is actually like the Potomac, and it just. <laughs> 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 right. yeah. um, what you mean the oil river? <laughs> um, so at first, when that flame like comes into existence, it's still surprising because you just don't see that kind of stuff, you know, all the time. It's also dark, and, and you're also your vision too, where you're used to the ambient light, the starlight. You know, you get oh, adjusted to that, warning and suddenly. Bang, there's this light right there that's that kind of bright. It is starling, and you probably do say something. Like when the teacher like that turns on the lights right after like watching a video or something. Damn teacher. Right? <laughs> uh, and then she cocks her arm back and throws it. And what's the destination you want to, to, I to get to? I want it to land like in the, as to, towards the far side of the river. It's not going to go all the way across the, the river, but as far as I can, just to see if we can light anything up on the far bank. Okay, so in that moment, and it is just a moment, as that that flame, that light is traveling in that direction and as it's arcing down, you can see a human silhouette 
for just a moment and the shadow stretched out and then the silhouette in that moment changes as whatever it was was turning to look like to see what that was and then sprints just dead away from all of you. <sighs> I was going to say, like, a fire then, arrow, I'm probably not ready. I don't the light goes bow. out as it comes in contact with that part of the river and you're at the end of your range. So, do the two of you go back to sleep and let Zellin just stay on watch? Nope. <laughs> so, we, the three we, of you stay up for the rest of the, the night? Do we want to row in the dark? No, that's no. worse. Um, we, what time is it? How long into her watch? Only a couple of hours. Happen? I'll probably stay awake for an hour, maybe two, then get some sleep before mine. Okay, so you go through your watch. I keep my bow. I put it closer to me so that way as soon as the next time I'm woken up, I have it ready. I'm so, getting, I'm becoming some kind of weird Gandalf. I've got sword in one hand and hammer in the other. <laughs> <laughs> so Zelen, at the end of your watch, when you think, oh, it's about the right time, I'm going to wake one of these guys up, uh, you got the feeling that Boris was saying he would, uh, he would go next? Yeah, so you wake Boris up and you go to sleep, Boris. Nothing else happens, anything like that, through the rest of your watch. It okay. stays quiet. Uh, at the end of my watch, I wake up Jacob. I and, watch next. And your watch also passes without any particular incident. Toward the end of your watch, it, it starts to get that pre-dawn noisiness as birds are moving, uh, animals are moving. I'm not sure you take the time to hunt or whatnot, but you do hear things moving around, but it seems normal and natural to what would take place pre-dawn in any you know, wild, wild area. I uh, gotcha. I'll, uh, uh, it's been a full rest at this point or. Yeah. We'll call it a full rest. Yeah. So I'll, I'll wake up everyone else and then I'll, I'll venture not too far away, maybe, um, uh, like 20, 30 feet or so just, uh, to look around for just tracks in the immediate area that, uh, are not so animal. on your own side. Or are you seeing you're crossing the river? Uh, how deep is the river? Well, it gets deep enough that you'd have to swim across it in the midpoint. Okay. And then at that point, uh, do you guys want to like just. As we load back up, cross the river real fast, we can go in and I can take a look at the tracks this person may have left. It might be easier to just get in the boat and you know, yeah, that's row. What, okay, that's yeah. what I mean. Loading yeah, everything yeah. back up. Yep. All right, so you... Uh, Cold breakfast, pack up, morning prayers, hop in, cross river on boat. Perfect. And then we get to the other side of the river, a little bit upstream. You know, Jacob, you hop out of it and you start uh, tracking to see what you can find there. Yes. Uh, go ahead and roll that. That's what a uh, nature for you, isn't it? Survival. Uh, Probably. Right. If you want to do, yeah. Yeah. Six. Uh, you don't find the tracks in and of themselves. Like there's no, you know, boot print or something that's standing out that way. Uh, but go ahead and roll your investigation for any other kind of clue. Natural 16 for an 18. As you're looking at that area and not finding a track and nothing seems particularly like there's, you know, broken branches or grass that's matted down or anything like that, you pick up a scent and that scent is that of rot. And as you're you're testing the area, it's as though that something like a like a rotted animal is drugged to this place and then drug away. But but there's no signs of it being dragged. It's just that something left that scent right here. A lingering in smell this, of in rotting area. flesh. Yeah. And that's all you can find in that area. Uh, with with that it's enough information for me. I head back to the party and I share what I found. As you're walking back to the boat, you're thinking to yourself, something is tracking you. Thanks for listening. Make sure to follow us at The Empire's Edge on Twitter and Instagram. To learn more about the characters, go to TheEmpire'sEdge.com and MattSinkovich.com. That's M-A-T-T-S-I-N-C-E-V-I-C-H.com. If you'd like to support the podcast, go to SubscribeStar.com slash The-Empire's-Edge. Thank you.